Welcome to a new series. This will be a completely different format of video. Here we'll be diving into the history of mafias and cartels, all under the name of education and awareness. In this series, you will learn the roots of the problems, not just what transpired. You will learn about what circumstances led to the formation of these underground operations. From 1800s Chinatown, 1900s Ohio, and to current day Mexico, these stories can no longer go untold. So join me as I explore a world that was never taught in schools. This is the new and improved Swamp Stories. So with all that being said, let's dive right in. Jalisco New Generation, power, takeover, and total destruction, all in the name of massive profits. Today, the cartel is worth over $50 billion, but with this money comes a whole lot of problems. Jalisco New Generation has caused an immense amount of damage in order to gain their wealth. They have overtaken national forces, decimated their opposition, and taken control of much of Mexico, all in just 13 years. But in order to understand how this happened, we must go back to the star. Everything started out with a young man named Nemesio Cervantes, also known as El Mencho. He grew up in the small town of Aguilia Michoacan, which is located in the middle of nowhere. There, his family picked avocados to support their five children. Well, by age 11, El Mencho dropped out of school to work in the fields with his parents. After seven long years of working countless hours and barely getting by, El Mencho decided to take the risk of a lifetime. At 18 years old, he traveled all the way from southern Mexico to the San Francisco Bay Area. There, he did what he could to survive and quickly found his next path. While roaming around the Tenderloin and Mission District neighborhoods, Nemesio discovered a chance to get rich. He noticed a market that he could take advantage of, especially given his connections back home. So El Mencho began traveling back and forth from his hometown to San Francisco, bringing over loads of you-know-what. After a few months, he and his brother-in-law Abigail Valencia set up shop in the nearby suburb of Redwood City. They purchased a suburban home in order to stay low-key, and from there they distributed to the whole Northern California. However, this journey did not come without bumps in the road. In just a year and a half, El Mencho was arrested five times in San Francisco, but for whatever reason, the district attorney let him go each time. The first investigations. After seeing so many arrests and no consequences, the DEA opened an investigation. They began tracking down El Mencho until they caught him in the act. However, due to California law, El Mencho could not be sentenced. Instead, he would be extradited back home. Upon his return to Mexico, El Mencho decided to join the federal police. Now you may be thinking that this is against the code of the streets. However, in Mexico they play by a whole different set of rules. Down there it's very common for police officers to be criminals and vice versa. In fact, some people join the police force as a way to get connected to the cartels. And for El Mencho, this is exactly what he did. While patrolling the Jalisco region, he got connected to the Milenio Cartel. This is a smaller cartel that was formed by avocado farmers in the Michoacan region. Because of this similarity, El Mencho had serious trust for the leadership. Milenio was led by Oscar Valencia, also known as El Lobo. And early on, rumors say that he took a great liking to El Mencho. So Mencho saw the opportunity and was willing to do anything to climb the ranks. So he opted to begin at the lowest rank. This meant handling any task they may need. And by task, I hope you know what I mean. So let me set the context. At this time, Milenio was in a serious rivalry with Los Zetas. This was a dangerous group located in northern and eastern Mexico. They were led by former army lieutenants who put profit and control over anything else. So this is what El Mencho was up against, a task that most would not make it out of. However, this guy was something that Mexico had never seen before. He gained a wild reputation early on by being the most cold-blooded in the whole cartel. Because of this, Milenio designated him to lead the state of Colima. This is a smaller region of Mexico located right below Jalisco and west of Michoacan. Along with his designation, he was allowed to choose the name of his section. So he decided to call them Los Matazetas, meaning 
lots of Los Zetas in Spanish. That's how dedicated he was to the cause. And after years of running Colima, El Mencho seeked a larger role within Milenio. Everyone liked him, and most importantly, everyone followed his word. He was the perfect fit to run Milenio, so he patiently waited his turn. October 28th, 2009. After a major raid, Milenio leader Oscar Valencia was arrested and sent away for life. So finally, after all this time, it was Mencho's chance to run Milenio, right? Nope, instead, Oscar's brother nicknamed El Tigre was given the role. This was controversial because many within the cartel wanted El Mencho to become the leader. Of course, El Mencho was angry about the decision and he decided to complain to the leadership. This would not end well for him. In the world of cartels, complaining to those above you is one of the worst decisions you can make. So the incarcerated leader Oscar Valencia decided to send a big message. He would allegedly send a member named Tecato to take out three of El Mencho's favorite associates. El Mencho felt disrespected, but before acting out, he would make Milenio an offer. You hand over Tecato to me, and I'll leave the situation alone. Milenio would not agree, and they would actually make the situation worse. They accused El Mencho of being the informant that got Oscar arrested. Essentially, they believed that Mencho set him up so that he could be the next leader. Whoa, in the world of cartels, accusing somebody of ratting is the worst thing you can call them. All of this led El Mencho to make a huge decision. So he called a meeting with everyone who he believed was loyal to him, not Milenio. This included his two favorite guys, Eric Valencia and Martin Ortega. He explained the situation and asked everyone if they would join him and leave Milenio. Everyone agreed, so Los Matazetas broke apart from Milenio. This is despite being outnumbered, having less funds, and claiming far less territory. But either way, El Mencho was ready for the challenge. He despised his former bosses, and they certainly despised him as well. This was the revenge of the underdogs, and here's how it played out. 2009 and 2010 were wild years in southwest Mexico. El Mencho, Eric, and Martin made it their mission to take down Milenio. From Colima, they quickly made it up to Jalisco, taking over one town at a time. Milenio took El Mencho as a joke and had no idea what was coming. And by 2011, he had taken over most of Jalisco. So as a result, he changed the name to Jalisco New Generation, also known as CJNG. This all but certified that they were the new kings of Jalisco. Well, after battling Milenio, El Mencho never forgot about his old rivals. So let's take a trip to the Gulf Coast of Mexico. Historically, the Gulf Coast was territory of Los Zetas, and one of their strongholds was the state of Veracruz. Well, for whatever reason, El Mencho sent his guys on a horrible mission, something that I cannot fathom. On the morning of September 20th, 2011, 35 Los Zetas associates were found near a shopping mall in Boca del Rio. This incident caught national and global attention due to its severity, and it certainly gave CJNG a horrible reputation to start with. It was later discovered that only 6 of the 35 were Los Zetas members. Either way, CJNG would release a public statement stating that they are the new proprietors of Veracruz. Of course, this prompted the Mexican government to step in and launch Operation Safe Veracruz. They sent the Mexican military and federal police to patrol the streets 24-7. Sadly, this would do nothing to stop the chaos, it would just move it to another region. At this time, El Mencho had taken over the northern city of Culiacán, November 23rd, 2011. 4 a.m. Local police get a call about burning vehicles in a parking lot, so the fire department comes and puts them out. There, 26 CJNG members are found. Although it's unofficial, researchers believe that Los Zetas carried this out. Unfortunately, these events would continue at an alarming rate, worse than Mexico had ever seen before. And things only got worse when CJNG joined together with the Sinaloa cartel. Well, by the start of 2012, it's estimated that Sinaloa and CJNG claimed over 500 lives. And this prompted Mexican authorities to name El Mencho as their number one most wanted man. Once he saw the headline, Mencho decided to head to the small town of Tonaya to hide out.
The beautiful town lays between two mountains, making it secluded from any population. This is where he planned to relax and wait for the attention to pass over. This lasted for a few months until things would go terribly wrong. August 15th, 2012. Mexican police receive an anonymous call saying that the wanted man is living in town. So instantly they send forces to the small town. After locating his hideout, police surround him and his 12 bodyguards. And here El Mencho makes a wild decision. He orders his guards to start blasting off as he runs to his car. Six of his guards would not make it and El Mencho was found on a nearby interstate. El Mencho was finally in custody. So this was the end, right? Somehow, within 24 hours of capture, El Mencho had escaped and was nowhere to be found. After escaping, Mencho was driven to the city of Guadalajara, where CJNG had their largest presence. Once they learned the news, Mexican authorities were furious and decided to track him down. So the president sent thousands of officers to the city of Guadalajara. However, once they arrived, every single highway was blocked off by burning cars. CJNG made Guadalajara completely inaccessible. No one could could leave or enter the city, all to keep their leader from getting arrested. And at this point, the police made the smart decision to back off. At this moment, they knew that Jalisco New Generation was far more powerful than they are. On the other hand, the United States DEA was tracking down El Mencho the entire time. Unfortunately, there was nothing they could do. However, they did discover that his wife and son were hiding out in the small city of Gulfport, Mississippi. They searched the home in hopes of finding him, but he was nowhere to be found. Instead, he was living comfortably in Guadalajara while calling shots and trying to take over the entire country of Mexico. So let me break things down once again. At this time, CJNG was cool with Sinaloa and rivaled Los Zetas and Milenio. But in 2012, they wanted to expand their list of rivals. So on August 11th, 2012, they uploaded a four minute video on Blog del Narco. For those unfamiliar, this is how the cartels communicate to the general public. While in the video, they announced that their next plans are to take over the states of Michoacan and Guerrero. They also addressed the local and federal police, telling them to stay out of the way because this mission is for the better of the people. Essentially, CJNG blamed problems in these two states on the Knights Templar. They called them immoral and bothered some to hardworking civilians. The next day, August 12th, 2012. 21 Knights Templar members are found throughout the state of Michoacan. This took the Knights leader Servando Martinez by surprise as he had never had any problems with CJNG. This rivalry went back and forth, resulting in one of the biggest conflicts in Mexican history. The worst part is that this all started for absolutely no reason. Some say that the reason for these takeovers is financial gain. The idea is that lowering competition will increase their market share. And sadly, in this case, profit was put over humanity. When is enough money enough to just sit down and relax. Well, this wasn't in El Mencho's plans. By 2015, it's estimated that he reached a net worth of $15 billion. This would make him richer than Charles Schwab, Mickey Arison, and Robert Kraft. Because of this immense wealth, CJNG has been able to pay off authority since the very start. So you may wonder why so many officers cave in, but once you see how much they make, you may empathize. The starting salary for a federal police officer in Mexico is 9,260 pesos a year. That is equivalent to 474 US dollars. Then the highest level of earnings is capped out at 32,000 pesos a year. This is only 1,600 US dollars. So this means that paying an officer $1,000 will likely be higher than his entire salary. I just wanted to point that out so we can humanize things and get off of our American high horse. So overall, many officers cave in, but when they don't, CJ NG sends a message. In April of 2015, the federal government once again made an attempt to capture El Mencho. April 7th, 2015, Jalisco, Mexico. Three trucks full of 15 officers drive to the mountain where El Mencho resides. When they arrive in town, they notice that the only road is blocked off by two buses. So they scratch their heads and wonder how CJNG knew that they were coming. They could sense that this was a bad sign, so they quickly decided to turn around. But that's when CJNG members come out from behind the buses. 
El Mencho had explicitly ordered police to stay off his case or else things like this would occur. He knew from inside sources that they were coming, that's why he was prepared. Mexico now understood that sneaking up on him would be impossible, so instead they sent an all-out blitz. April 30th, 2015 10 a.m. Mexico's president takes to Twitter to let the public know that tonight, CJNG will be officially dismantled. At 12 a.m., 10,000 officers are sent to Jalisco at once. When they arrive, every single road is blocked. Literally every single connection to Jalisco is blocked off. 6.30 a.m. The government is overly frustrated, so they come up with another plan. They decide to send a helicopter into Jalisco. However, El Mencho knew that it was coming. So as the helicopter is descending into town, CJNG goes full GTA. Right after the incident, President Nieto sent out a tweet of condolences and thanked all the courageous officers. Sadly, El Mencho was not captured and CJNG proved how untouchable they really are. However, some good did come out of this. For the first time ever, the community decided to stand against them. This was all too much, all of this destruction for greedy profits and control. So on May 9th, over a thousand residents marched across Guadalajara. The number of supporters was definitely higher, but many Many people were scared to show out against the cartel. Well, these demonstrations could not stop the billion dollar train known as Jalisco New Generation. At this point, no one could stop them except for themselves. In March of 2017, the co-founder Eric Salazar departed from the cartel. This was a shocking move, especially given his powerful position, second in command to El Mencho. Well, after splitting, he started his own cartel, known as Nueva Plaza. This did not make El Mencho happy, so the former friends turned into bitter enemies. This rivalry has been wild from the start, however, we should cover it in a separate episode, so please let me know if you want to see that. To conclude this episode, let me briefly recap the last five years of Jalisco New Generation. Since 2017, their ascent has been exponential, taking over regions that no one thought they ever could. This is a 2020 map. The areas in red are completely controlled by CJNG, and the areas in pink have some level of CJNG control. During this time, almost every cartel in Mexico has lost leaders over and over again. But for some odd reason, El Mencho has never been touched. His own son, El Manchito, has even been arrested, but not him. Currently, he is Mexico's most wanted man, even to the point where the U.S. sees him as a threat as well. The U.S. government is offering $10 million for anyone who will turn him in. Sadly, you have a higher chance of winning the lottery three times in a row. But now let's change gears to some surprising positivity. During the 2020 pandemic, many cartel leaders stepped up to the plate. As many people were stuck at home without income, El Mencho invested millions in providing food and necessities to the poor. Obviously, this is a great thing, but it leaves me perplexed. If the cartels have the capacity for so much good, why does damage and destruction continue? Also, if anyone is watching from Mexico, feel free to leave your stories in the comments. Well, this served as a brief summary of CJNG, however, there's so much more to it. So please let me know if you want to see more. With that being said, thank you so much for watching. Peace!